In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it is the last episode where we are doing the NBA prospects on the final four teams, and we are saving the best for last, and that is the UConn Huskies, who are looking to repeat as national champions. They'd be the first team to repeat since Florida. I guess that was almost like, and that wasn't like 20 years ago, but all it of those was. guys are out of the uh-huh. NBA except <laughs> Al Horford, the team with Joaquin Noah, Corey Brewer, Al Horford. But UConn has been dominant. The question is, can anybody beat UConn? But they're also a very unique team from an NBA draft perspective. We're talking about a team that could possibly have two lottery picks, but their top three scores may even go undrafted. So stay tuned to hear our thoughts on this UConn team. We're going to talk about Donovan Klingon, Defon Castle, Tristan Newton, Alex Caraba, I mean, they got quite a few guys that I think could see some time in the NBA in the near future, so stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board, and my co-host is my brother, James, the president of NBA Big Board. I know we come up with a, a different title, but I'm really looking forward to what we have coming up on NBA Big Board this spring and this summer. I'm saying it's the summer of separation, but I'm really looking forward to some of the content that we have lined up. And this series has been fun. We've talked about the 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 best NBA prospects on these final four teams. And it's weird because there are teams that could like NC State and Alabama could possibly not have anybody drafted. Purdue could, I mean, they have one player drafted. UConn could have two lottery picks, but those two lottery picks aren't even in their top three scores. So this this whole Final Four is going to be interesting. I mean, college basketball is interesting because it's getting older and older every year. So you're going to have more and more fifth-year guys dominating and leading their team deep in tournament runs. And those guys may not even be NBA prospects, but – If you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Make sure you click the bell so you can be notified every time we post because we are posting content five days per week. All right. I got a question for you, James. Can anybody beat UConn? Number one, it's a two-part question. And who is UConn's best NBA prospect? Or let me reword that. Who will be the first UConn player selected? Mm. for NBA draft nobody can beat UConn let's get that out of the way part two who will be the first UConn player selected in the 2024 NBA draft let me dance around that question real quick man we not dancing around here hold no on, tap man. dancing I wanna, hold on I want to come clean alright Michael Jackson no tap dancing let me, let me come Brown. clean I think I I've I've turned the corner on Donovan Klingon, man. Okay, a lot, like a whole lot. He's been very very impressive. I have a theory as to why he's been playing a lot better. Um, is but it with health? that, to huh? Is well, it health? yeah, it's health. But I also feel like the weight loss has helped him out too. I think he lost what twenty pounds during the season. If I'm correct, I don't Allegedly. know. I mean, I saw him listed at two sixty five. Then I saw him listed at two eighty. I didn't. I mean, I'm not really good at just looking at somebody and saying like, "Wow, they look like they've gained a lot of weight." I know unless he's it's, moving. Unless it's DJ Burns. <laughs> I mean, but even then, oh yeah, I mean that that picture from him at Tennessee and where he's at <laughs> now. But um, but no, I mean he's just moving better. He's moving different. He had a couple like lower leg, ankle, foot injuries that he was dealing with, but he's he's healthy now. So I think that the health is a bit, con- you know, I mean, a big reason why he's back to like dominating and looking like the player that I thought he would be coming into this season, and the guy that showed flashes of dominance last year in limited minutes. But I thought it was weird that he was listed at two eighty coming into mm. the season. I wonder well, what he's at now. If he's two sixty, he looks. Like he can move better. He looks to be in better shape. Um, and I am coming around on him. I've had him in the 20s. I'm Ooh. going to move him up quite a bit. I'm still putting my stuff together, you know, but I, I want to publicly say that 
he's growing on me a lot. And with that said, I still think Stefan Castle is the best NBA prospect on that team. So we'll, we'll keep talking about Klingon here. ESPN still has him listed at 7'2", 280. Again, I don't know if, if I mean, he gained 15 pounds from last year. I don't understand why, if that was like a strategy, like why does, I mean, obviously, you that. know, you would need him to get stronger, but I don't think you need him to put on 15 pounds, especially if he's 7'2", 7'2", 265 is, is, is good enough. You just need him it's to perfect. get stronger. I don't believe in putting on too much weight on him, especially when his NBA career is going to be based off of how well he moves on the defensive end. Maybe if he were like this generational back to the basket center with great touch around the rim, right? Then it's like, you know, the weight would be okay. Nobody's going to be able to stop him <laughs> as he gets stronger right. anyway. But he Maybe has to be mobile. Yeah, but if his game is based off of defense and all of that, then I think you need him, like I said, to be stronger, but you need him to, to be as mobile and as athletic as possible, because that's where he's going to get most of his points in the NBA is off of vertical lobs, being a finisher around the rim, not someone that you're giving the ball to in the post. So, but he, he looks good. I mean, last year, the flashes were incredible, like just mm -hmm. in a short amount of minutes, the question I had coming into this year, and I was really high on him. I had him as a top 10 pick coming into the season. The question I had was, can he maintain that type of dominance in more minutes? Because he only averaged 13 minutes a game last year. Right. I still have that question a little bit because he's only averaging 22 minutes per game this year. Like, he's mm -hmm. not playing a lot of minutes. Even in this dominant, like, uh, tournament run, played 22 minutes against Illinois, 23 against San Diego State. I mean, part of it is because they're smacking teams and blowing them out. That's true. But he hasn't played 30 minutes since, I think, the, the Marquette game, the last game in the Big East tournament. In that game, he did play 30 minutes, and you saw, like, the best of him. He had 22 points, 16 rebounds, two blocks, 7 to 12 from the floor in 31 minutes. But other than that, just kind of looking at his numbers for the season, I think that's the only game he played 30 minutes. Now, he played 30 minutes against Illinois. I'm mean, not Illinois, against uh, Indiana when they played Kalel Ware. But other than yeah, that, man, he played 30 minutes against Kansas. Against Kansas, against Kansas. So, yeah, he had a dud that game. What's that? He had a dud that game, but he may not have been healthy against Kansas. Yeah, early in the season, he, was, he wasn't looking like he does now. So, I mean, that is a concern in a sense is that he hasn't really played big, big minutes. And can he maintain that dominance? And then on the flip side, you can say, well, imagine if he played 30 minutes. He may average 15 and 12 and four blocks or something like that. But, right. yeah, defensively, man, he he turns the paint to a no-fly zone, puts a lid on the rim, can impact games with just his size and his length. And then now that he's moving better, now you're starting to see, like, all right, he can be a vertical lob threat. He can run the floor. Mm -hmm. And that's what made him so unique to me last year was 7-2, 265 that he was listed at, I thought he moved exceptionally well for someone that big. I agree. Um, like I said, I'm gonna be moving him out of the 20s, but I'm gonna still dig deep into it. I don't know, man. I uh I'm trying to think. I, I don't want to compare him to when I do compare him, I look at the last like rim running defensive bigs who are drafted in the teens or the lottery, and he's not as athletic as them, Okay, if that makes sense. So that right. was kind of my, huh? Go ahead. Yeah, that's just that was like kind of my, that's kind of my issue with him, right? So on one hand, somebody will say, well, well Walker Kessler was this, that, and the other at uh, Auburn his last year, and you see Walker Kessler still limited to like 24 minutes per game. I mean, I don't know, because Utah, whatever is Utah doing. And then you say, uh, but also you look at uh, my man Mark Williams in Charlotte. Like, he's obviously the better athlete than Klingon. And where did he go? Like 14, 13, 14 or something like that? Yeah, having health issues, injuries. Health issues. issues, too. So it's like, that's my biggest issue. Uh, I've seen ESPN. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not, everybody's opinions are different. I've seen them have him top five. I don't know if I can take somebody top five with no offensive game. 
who's going to be, you know, a defensive stopper. But I'm 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 uh I'm definitely warming up to Klingon. All right, when we return, I want to talk a little bit more about his offensive game, and then I want to talk about Stefan Castle. You've been on the Stefan Castle train. You were on it last summer. You were on it all season long. I had an interesting conversation with some NBA people about Castle, and I want to get your opinions mm. on that. Stay tuned. But let's talk about Prize Picks, which is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. And it is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. You just pick more or less than two or more player stats and you can watch the winnings roll in. And March is officially over, but the biggest moments in college sports tip off this month of April, that is. So you can be part of the action on Prize Picks for both men's and women's college basketball. Plus, the NBA playoffs are right around the corner. You can get in on the playoff action and win a hundred times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during the NBA postseason. And the play-in tournament is, what, April 16th, 17th, 19th. The playoffs at the 20th, April 20th, that is. And check this out. You can now win up to a hundred times your money on prize picks. With as little as four correct picks, you could turn 10 bucks into a thousand. That is an incredible flip. With basketball, hockey, and college basketball entries today on prize picks, again, America's number one fantasy app. So go to prizepicks.com, use the promo code locked on NBA. It has to be in lowercase letters, though. Use the promo code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. Again, prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. For a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pick more, pick less. It is that easy at prizepicks.com. All right, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day and you have to turn down the volume because all they're doing is shouting and screaming and coming up with fake debates? Well, you can make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, which is a free 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming channel which is programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all of the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, we left off talking a little bit about Donovan Klingon's offense. I mean, against Illinois, I saw they gave him the ball a couple of times on the block, and he made a couple. Not jump giving hooks. him the ball on the block. I mean, yeah, offensively, he still has a ways to go. I know there were like rumors that he could shoot, and that you were going to see an expanded offensive game this season. Hurley I mean, was like, "Nah, we good." <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a couple plays here and there where he showed shot, something. He shot against seven Illinois, threes. Illinois, he was man. nine of thirteen from the floor. And so he he has had some performances where, not saying that they were giving him the ball on the block and he was showing like an array of post moves and touch, but he had a 9 of 11 game against Stetson, 9 of 13 against Illinois. He had the 7 of 12 game against Marquette. So I think he's shown that he can score and, and put the ball in the basket. Still young. Maybe he can develop at least a a reliable jump hook. I'm a little bit hesitant to say he'll be able to space the floor. That was like the, the rumor, like, man, he can shoot threes. He's been working on it. No, he, he's I, I still a 50, 55% free throw shooter. Nah, 57. All right, my <laughs> but, fault. But no, but no, you're right. 57 this year, but 55 over two years because he shot 51% last year. And so I have a hard time believing a guy that shoots 50-something percent from the foul line is going to be a, a three-point shooter, at least not – on his rookie contract, maybe somewhere down the line. But what do you think about him on the offensive end? Like, what do you think is like a best case scenario for him? Can he at least be Steven Adams on the offensive end where he has a jump hook that's serviceable? You see, I don't think he has Steven Adams offensive ability. I feel like he just lacks and not to say that Steven Adams was, you know, Blake Griffin by any means, but he just lacks like pop and traffic. And that is like my biggest concern about him, you know? And again, my, my theory is this, right? So again, I'm not expecting you to be an offensive hub, obviously not, 
Can you catch lobs? Yes, he can catch lobs, but we can switch on him, right? We're not going to double him ever in the post. If he scores on my guard, man, great, because we'll have help to come and, you know, change his shot. Um, I'm kind of on the fence as far as to if I want to take him or Misi first, because I think Misi's the better athlete. And he's, you know, I mean, he's just a year younger. He's shown me some stuff off the dribble. So I'm like, okay. But also Misi is extremely raw. He may dribble off his foot and fall down. Yeah. But Klingon, I just, I don't know, man. I, I just have this thing about like my bigs taking them that high when they are 1000% dependent on a guard feeding them. Again, I understand great defensive player has, he's definitely changed my opinion of him uh, and his mobility. Uh, but the offense is, is I feel like there's a, a ceiling on his offensive game that he's approaching pretty soon. I think Klingon is going to go a lot higher than Kalel Ware, but I also think that Kalel Ware could end up being the better NBA player because he's way more skilled on the offensive end. Had some very big offensive games. I think Kalel Ware is going to be able to space the floor, I think, in a reduced role. Where he's offensively, I think they're going to have the same role in the NBA: be a play finisher, finish live. But I think Khalil Ware is someone that you can start running pick and pops for. But I mean, let me let me ask you a question, Ralph. You're the Memphis Grizzlies, and you have the eighth pick in the draft. I'm going with Klingon. You're taking Klingon over Misi. Yeah, I'm I think Klingon fits your timeline because you 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 would have to develop Misi. Or is yeah, playing um, play right now? You think? I mean, so they're you, they're I, in a, they got a weird timeline anyway. Like they have their core already, and then they got some young, intriguing pieces. But I think next year they're going to be expected. To I feel win. like I feel so. like they have to win because your their timeline is Oklahoma City's timeline, which is also Minnesota's timeline. Their best players are twenty four, twenty five. Right. And then and I, I think you could throw Dallas in there. I mean, obviously Kyrie's a little older, but Kyrie's gonna be able to play for a long time. <laughs> oh yeah, Kyrie's Luca's is, still um, only 24. I mean, yeah. you figure lot. So, but no, I, I get what you're saying. But no, if I were Memphis, I feel like I've already seen how my window can close fast, how it can look yes. like we're the future, and then yeah. we are a top five pick the next year. So yeah. I would go, I would go, I would go with Cleveland. Klingon. I understand. Right. Stefan Castle, you're really high on Castle. You've been high on him for a minute. I mean, do you think that there is a chance if he like shines in these next two games or possibly two games that he could creep up in top five range? Because this draft is wide open. Yes. What would you he know. need to do? He would need to. I don't want to say make a couple of jump shots. He's going to have to do that. I think you're going to have to see a huge – he's going to have to have some great workouts as far as his jump shot, jump shooting ability. I think it's, again, like I mentioned with uh, Mark Sears, it's kind of like a gift and a curse when you play with other talented you know, guys. So Castle doesn't have to go out there and force the issue because you know what? That team is super talented. But he had – I don't want to use that reference. He made life very difficult for Terrence Shannon who had been on a tear. Crazy tear. For, right? He he made life very Man. difficult for him. Shannon was two for 12. He was averaging like 28 a game. He's, I know he scored exactly. 102 in the Big Ten tournament. I think he was averaging like 28 a game in the NCAA tournament. I mean, I, I'm going to give you these numbers. And, and I'm going to show you how that – I mean, obviously – Clinging is there to cling things. Oh yeah, up. yeah, for sure. But that's but, that's still a great defense, though. Right. I'm Before, your guy into shot blockers. Great defense. Right. Before UConn, Terrence Shannon, 29 against Iowa State, 30 against Duquesne, 26 against Moorhead State. Uh, in the Big Ten, 34 against in the Big Ten uh, tournament, 34 against Wisconsin, 40 against Nebraska, 28 against Ohio State. 25 against Iowa faces UConn and Klingon and Castle two for 12. And he played 36 minutes. It wasn't like he got subbed out when he was getting slapped by 30. He, yeah, he was still even, getting them up. Yeah. He, so that, so, so you're saying that you think just on the defensive end alone, Castle is one of the better perimeter defenders in this Look, class. 
I feel like, and again, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. He's a jump shot away, right? I think there's some Brandon Roy, Jimmy Butler in his game, and he may be getting not held back because he's doing the exact. I mean, he has a chance to win a national championship as a freshman, right? I don't think we're seeing the total package from him because that team is so talented. I think there's some Brandon Roy in there, man. Speaking of he's Brandon not Roy, six seven, but he's about six five. Yeah, and so I, I've, I, I've been talking to different personnel. Yes, trying to please get their tell me this on guys. So there was one guy that I spoke with, and he was not high on Castle, and he was like, "I don't know what he does," and he said that he thinks Castle, and I'm and I've never heard this, I've never heard this opinion before on Castle, but he says. I think Castle would have been better in the 2000s NBA where you could use your physicality and play ISO ball. He's like, I think he's best if you like gave him the ball at like the elbow and kind of clear things out and let him like play ISO because he's tough and he's physical. He's like, his game was built for the 2000s. So his concern is, I don't know if he's a point. And I don't know if he's not a point if he shoots it well enough to where you can play him off the ball. And he's like, in today's NBA, if you don't have those skills, it's going to be hard for you to find like your niche on offense. And so he was saying that he believes if he had the same skill set in the 90s, they may say, all right, we're going to run some isolation plays for you at the elbow, mid post and let you go to work. But I, he can play pick and roll, and he's a very good passer too. So like but he was saying, like you know, and that we talked about that, and he was just saying like, yeah, but if you can play pick and roll, and everybody's going way under on your screens, then it kind of limits how effective you can be. But he was like, I still don't know if he's a good enough decision maker where he can be your primary. And so if he's not your primary, and you play him on the wing, and he's passing up jump shots. And he was saying it in relation to like the team that he works with. And he was like, the team that he works with has their dudes in a mm-hmm. sense. And he was like, I can't put him on the floor right now with one with our roster because he's going to like muck things up if he's not but our primary. So, I don't know who you talk to, and you obviously not gonna divulge, but like I said, I think if you put him in a situation like the Wizards, where you don't have to be, he doesn't have to be the primary. He can be a co ball handler. Yep. So let's say, you know, whatever they say, we'll play him and Poole together. Like that will work because Poole can play on the ball or off the ball, right? And then we know he's going to cut because he's been playing off the ball with Connecticut. Yep. Um, shoot, I can't put him in Detroit because they got way too much going on in Detroit. But, but I mean, there's certain teams where it's like, all right, if he's not going to have the ball in his hands a lot then it is very, very important for him to show that he can knock down corner shots. I think he's a jump shot away from being the best player in the draft. But again, he has to show that he can shoot. I just feel like with Connecticut, he doesn't have to force the issue. And it doesn't, I mean, you know, if he played, if he was in Isaiah Kyer's situation, you got to shoot those shots, right? You don't have a choice because if you're not uh, aggressive, we're not going to win. But again, I think that as a co-ball handler, a co-lead, I think he has a lot of talent. I think it could work with him in Charlotte. And you have three guys handling the ball eventually when LaMelo gets healthy. You know what I'm saying? Man, so it's like healthy, man, them ball brothers, man. I think yeah. all that work on the sand dunes, I think their legs might be cooked. That's hey, a whole man. different subject. But yeah. now Castle only shot 26% from three this year. I think he's a much better shooter, like a rhythm shooter. Like if you and, and I get kind of get where the guy's coming from. If you put him in isolation, he can either go through the defender, or if the defender's backing up, he's much more comfortable shooting that you know, that that pull-up mid-range jumper as opposed to shooting threes when they go under the screens or playing off the catch. So I kind of get where the guy was coming from, but, you know, everybody has different opinions. All right, when we return, we got to talk about the other guys on UConn's team because Klingon and Castle were like their fourth or fifth leading yeah. scorers on the team, but yet I think they're going to be both top 10 picks. So stay tuned. We're going to talk about the other guys on UConn's roster, like Tristan Newton 
and Cam Spencer and Alex Carabon who could see themselves on NBA rosters next year. All right, before we get into the last segment, I want to let you know that Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides you with access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV so whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the NCAA tournament, you are going to want to have a Fire TV because Fire TV recently created the Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us that locked on and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. And Fire TV lets you dive into all of the game analysis highlights and more to keep up to date on all of the latest in the world of sports, whether it's March Madness, NBA, Major League Baseball, and more. Not to mention they have great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. And if you haven't checked out the Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, go to Amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, last segment. Cam, or Tristan, I don't know. I was about to call him Cam Newton. <laughs> <laughs> Tristan Newton has had like one of the more underrated seasons in college basketball. He leads UConn in points. He's second in rebounds, and he's first in assists. And he's he's actually from El Paso, like the, Texas. He's a, yeah, El Paso, <laughs> Texas. He's a fifth-year guy, spent three years at um, Eastern Carolina. Last year, he was good. He averaged like 10 points a game last year, like 10, 4, and 4. No buzz coming into the season. This year, he ups it to 15, like 6 and 6, triple-double threat. Shot, um, you know, only 41% from the floor, 32% from three. That's a little bit concerning, but he shot 36% last season. I think he is a guy that could go undrafted because of his age, but and find shooting. himself, huh? And shooting. Yep. But find himself on a two way and somehow find a way to crack a roster and, and, and have some type of impact because there's so many things that he does well as far as rebounding, passing. I mean, good size. I mean, Players that are 6'5", that can score, rebound, and pass, I mean, those guys don't come off. And so what are your thoughts on Tristan Newton? He reminds me of DeLon Wright. Okay. Where he's a big point guard, uh, and he can, you know, whether he's drafted or not, again, I think he has an opportunity to way. Um, but he's like a... He's just going to be, I think, a good backup point guard in the NBA when he's given that opportunity. Because like you said, he does so many things very well. And again, triple-double threat, he's 6'5". Uh, my biggest issue, again, is the shooting with him. Um, for a five-year guy, a fifth-year guy, excuse me, and he's just like a career 32% three-point shooter, that's going to be tough. And he's going to have to really improve. And again, like DeLon Wright is – how can I say this? He's really good on teams that aren't good, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And but he's he's a guy that he's been moved around a lot, but somebody he's always a wants long him. Time. Yeah. yeah. And somebody yeah. always wants him. And he that's who Tristan Newton reminds me of. Uh I don't think he'll get drafted, but like you said, I think he does have a two way contract in the future for him. Yeah. No, I like him a lot. I just think that. He's kind of been overlooked in this situation, and he's he's been good for UConn the last the last couple of years. Talk about Cam Spencer, another guy who some people think is their most important player. Another transfer, like you said, UConn has old dudes, young, young dudes. dudes. I mean, this is another fifth year guy. He averaged fourteen points, a little under five rebounds, a little under four assists per game. Shot forty eight percent from the floor. 44% from three, has good size at 6'4". Cam Spencer, like, what do you think about him? Hey, 
As long as that three point shot is legit, which it looks like is very legit, forty two percent for his career, he's gonna get an opportunity, and he can shoot off the move too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And again, shooting is always a premium. Whether again, whether he gets drafted or not, he's gonna get an opportunity to shoot at the next level. You look at, I hate to make a complexion comparison to what's the name, AJ AJ Green. He got the black name, mm-hmm. AJ Green playing for uh, Milwaukee. Look. He may not play for a week, but if he gets in there, it's going up, and he can win you a game with his shooting, and he's stretching the floor. And I think that's what Cam Spencer's role is going to be in the NBA. May not play a lot, but he's always going to be ready to let it go. Funny thing about A.J. Green, I I remember a guy was telling me that he didn't know who he was, and he went up against him in the pre-draft process, and he was like – when you see them, you think like, okay, this guy must be a shooter. But they like when they got to playing like twos and and oh three, yeah, game for real. They were like he he was a problem, and the guy yeah. was basically saying like, and this this player was drafted ahead of him, but he was like, that's not a guy that you want to go up against in the pre draft process because you probably most guys aren't going to know who he is, and then when they get Man. in that workouts. And he he's showing what what he can do, but on the low he's a really good defender too. Yeah, like you know, dudes coming in, you know, they obviously you, they gonna go at him. Man, he holds his ground. Yeah, but yeah, that's what I think Cam Spencer's gonna be like. You know, great shooter, again, great size. Guys like that get an opportunity to play. All right, let's talk about their shooter. Last guy, Alex. I don't know if it's Caravan, Caravan. I, I keep hearing different things. Has a Defined skill set in the NBA. He's 6'8", can shoot. He shot 38% from three, which I think he went on a cold spell that kind of brought it below 40. Because I know at one point this season he was he was in the, the mid-40s. But he has a defined role. Not like the best athlete, but mm-hmm. can can make some things happen and can space the floor. Definitely a guy with, with that size that can shoot. You're always looking for someone like that to play a – a, a complimentary role to to your starters. What are your thoughts on 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 Alex? Again, like you said, great shooter. Um, the athleticism is a big concern because he's gonna probably have to guard fours. Yep. At six eight, and sometimes those fours can't shoot. Sometimes those fours are you know <laughs> Jason Tatum's. Uh, again, not saying he's a starter, but I think his biggest issue is not gonna be the shooting. Is what position he defends with him being such like an average athlete. That that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I just think like, again, with the shooting, you know, teams are going to like the in, intangibles and winning. I honestly think he comes back to school. I don't think it makes any sense for him to, oh. to, to leave. I mean, I think clean has gone. I think castle's gone. <laughs> Newton and Spencer they ran out of eligibility. Go. So I definitely think that, that he returns. And I imagine UConn is going to retool and they're going to get some really good guys in in the transfer portal. But I just wanted to bring him up because I think somewhere down the line, he's going to get an an opportunity. But to me, it just makes absolutely no sense for him to, to uh, enter the draft. Three years left Two. he got a lot. He's got a chance to make a lot of NAO money. How about that? Yep. Well, that wraps up this episode of the locked on NBA big board podcast. We did four episodes talking about the top NBA prospects Clay on the Thompson, last dude. four teams left in college basketball. Once again, it's Rafael and my brother James. Stay tuned. This week coming up, we're going to have episodes on the transfer portal and some of the top guys to look for in the, the transfer portal, some NBA prospects. A few guys that I thought had NBA draft buzz coming into the season didn't have a strong year. They that might be portal. that should be a two part episode there. We we might we got we got time and then there's some guys that could like maybe who's the next Dalton Connect the guy that enters the portal goes goes from a small school to a power five blows up into a potential first round pick so stay tuned we're gonna talk about the portal then we're gonna have episodes with Richard Stangman and Leaf Tuline we definitely want to get their opinions on this final four once again it's Rafael Barlow and my brother James thank you for listening to this four part series and we. Yarr!